Good afternoon and welcome to the Gen Detective video series. Today's video is, so what is a GEDCOM file anyway? Obviously Gen Detective uses one. It's the first thing you need to do. Other software programs use them. People talk about GEDCOM files in a very knowing tone of voice and you've never looked at one. You don't know the background behind it and honestly you probably don't care. As long as you go make this magical file and all kinds of things happen for you, everything's good. But there's some things that are changing in the landscape out there. And there are some reasons for you to get involved, for you to pay attention, and for you to be aware of what's going on. What is a GEDCOM file? We pick up our GE from Genealogical, D from Data, Communications file. It's a file written in a special format that genealogy programs and websites know how to read and interpret. It contains your tree. It contains all the people. It contains usually, hopefully, your sources, your citations. Hopefully it documents what your media files are, your supporting documentation. It contains all of your events, birth, death, marriage, census, all of those things, all of that information that we compile about our family is written to this single file. What does this really mean for you? It's a way to share your data. If you are working on a branch of your family and you meet a cousin, uh, Connie sitting here in the room has met a cousin from New Zealand through her great grandparents. His family immigrated to New Zealand from Poland. Her family came to Ohio from Poland. They have reconnected. We can share our information by exchanging files that contain the information about those family members we share in common. We can use it to upload our data to genealogy websites, Family Search, New Family Search, their big tree. We have Ancestry.com, Genie, MyHeritage. There are lots and lots of places out there and websites where we can upload our, our family tree. And we can load it into other genealogy software programs. That would be us, Gen Detective. We're one of those programs that consumes or reads that data, but there are a lot of others out there on the market. So what does this file get me? It stores your family tree in a single file on your computer in, an, in a way that other programs can use. It does not contain all of your documentation. It does state your sources. It states your citations. So the 1940 U.S. Census 1940 uh, Pennsylvania Armstrong County Enumeration District 3-43 page 15a family 22 contains all that kind of information. What's missing is the documentation file. It contains a pointer that tells you where that file is on the computer or in the cloud depending on the program you use but it doesn't put the file itself, the contents of those images in that tree. This is the textual data, our notes. This is the kind of information that's in that file. And if we're a little confused, don't worry, we're actually going to create one and take a look at it. You yourself can read that file. may not make a lot of sense. You'll recognize the data. It's a little bit difficult to read because it was really designed for computer programs, but we are going to take a look at one. We can email them to fellow researchers. We can upload them to websites. We can load them into other genealogy programs like Gen Detective. And then there's that little wrinkle. We can use them to switch tree managers. A subscription to a website gets to be too expensive. We can download our tree, take it with us, and go to a less expensive alternative. We decide that we don't like all the wifty new features in a program, our tree manager is running really slow, and hey, there's this other one, and I've really taken a look at it, and I really think I prefer to use that, we can take our tree from one program and move it to the other. And, and some of this contributes to some of the issues surrounding GEDCOM files. So, history. Version 1.0 was launched by the LDS Church in 1984. Time machine. Let's step back in time. 1984, the IBM PC. We were running in DOS. 
we were just getting version 1 of Windows. We were using modems to dial into uh, bulletin boards like Genie and CompuServe. And AOL was really big at the time. And we had all these, we had the starts of what the online community has evolved into. And wow, we had a 24K baud modem. Today we measure our throughput from the internet in megabytes and gigabits. We used to measure it in terms of bytes, thousands of bytes a minute. The world has changed. And back in 1984, with the advent of the PCs, the LDS Church, looking forward, said, gee, instead of getting all of this paper from all of our members with their genealogy on, wouldn't it be nice if the program would send it to us? And that was the birth of the JEDCOM file. It allowed the family members to share or submit their research to the church electronically. Made things more efficient. Big step forward over all of the paper documentation. Vendors were approached. Church explained their perspective. The members explained their perspective. They certainly wanted to be able to do it this way. There were no Ancestry.coms and Family Search was still something to be born. And My Heritage and all of these websites. We did not even have the World Wide Web. I'm back in college during this time period. <laughs> okay, the world has changed a lot. But this was the genesis of the JEDCOM file that we are still using today. So, our history. Version 1 in 1984, version 2 in December of 85. Version 3, October of 87. Version 4, August of 89. Then we stretch out a little bit to 91, and then 5.5, 96. That's it, folks. That's where we are today. We did not have DNA testing. The Internet and the World Wide Web was just starting. We certainly didn't have Ancestry, Family Search, all of these things, my heritage, didn't exist yet. The world has changed a lot. But by 95, 96, the computer was very firmly entrenched in ways of recording our family history. Right? We recorded our genealogy in it. And a lot of the programs we initially used went out of business. They're no longer around. But we were okay because we had that JEDCOM file and we could get a lot of our data out and move to the new program. And if we lost a few things, well, it was okay, but, you know, that company went out of business, so you, we sucked it up and we moved on. But the key point here is there have been no new enhancements to the specification since 1996. What happened? The Internet happened. Family history and genealogy exploded. It moved from a hobby where we went to archives and historical societies, be they national, state, local, and courthouses. Now we started to find our information online. Online happened. All of these things happened and transformed it from a niche hobby where you purchased a piece of software for $25, $45, That was beyond photocopies, your big expense. You still hopped into your car, you drove to the library, you did your microfilm, you printed out your, your pieces of paper and you took them home and recorded the information in the computer. We weren't scanning yet. All of these things weren't quite happening, but here we are. It became big business. That happened. So if a lot of things have happened in the intervening years since 1996, and 2013. As I said, we now have DNA testing. There is no real standard way to record that DNA data in a JEDCOM file. We exploded into prime time. We now have Who Do You Think You Are in Season 4. We have the British version, which I believe is in Season 6, but somebody can correct me on that. We are very much moving away from uh, paper and archives into computers until we get as far as we can find the records online, and then we're back in the archives. But we can certainly do a lot more from the comfort of our home in front of the TV than we ever could before.
and the development is continuing to evolve the collaboration the fact that Connie can through an online forum make contact with an aunt or a relative in New Zealand is phenomenal an overall explosive growth in the industry and computers so today we've got a lot of choices to manage our tree and this is good for consumers this is good choice is always good right we're not in a monopoly situation. We have all these different websites, just to name a few that I am familiar with. There are hundreds or thousands more all over the world. There are many desktop program, programs. They are Windows-based. They are Mac-based. We have Roots Magic, Legacy, Family Tree Maker, Master Genealogist, Reunion. Not familiar with that? That's big in the Mac world. We have Mac Family Tree. We have programs specific to our preference of computer. We have tablets. We have little apps that we can take on the road and look up our family tree while we're out on the road because it's stored on the internet. Who would have envisioned this in 1996? We have the announcement of the retirement of PAF, of PATH. It's been an, a, a standard since 1984. So the world and the landscape around us has changed. Questions to this point? Personal ancestry file. Now, the dark side of JEDCOM files. JEDCOM files allow users to switch between vendors with relative ease. Right? It was They didn't go to the, the software makers and say, hey, we want to create this standard that allows users to swap files between each other and leave your product with ease. No, they'd have never done it. It would have been dead in the water. That was never the vision when the file was created. It was envisioned as a way to make life easier for the church. It's great for the consumer. It allows products like Gen Detective to even exist. If nobody opened up that data to share, there would be no way for us to fit into the market. Who's going to use a product like Gen Detective if you have to re record everything you've already done, right? The point is to do it once and use it many places, not do it many places to use once. The downside is this is not so good for the tree manager products, right? From a business perspective, it makes it easy, very easy, for the customer to get mad at you and say, sayonara, I'm taking my tree and I'm going to play in somebody else's sandbox, whether that is an online website or a desktop product. So there's a little bit of a downside there from a business perspective. From my personal business perspective, this is good because it allows the sharing, no redundancy of work. But from a tree manager company perspective, it's a little bit shaky. We like it, sort of, kind of, might even call it a necessary evil because the customers demand it. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. Issues abound. There has been no development of the specification since 1996. When you add to that a vendor desire to keep their customers, that equals a lot of custom extensions to the JEDCOM file. So the specification itself as a universal specification when the church stopped maintaining and enhancing the specification, customers were still demanding it. And so the vendor said, well, I guess so. And they put their stuff out there, but there's no way to support all the new things we're doing. So they do it on a custom basis. So we're losing some of the benefits because now if I as a consumer switch from product A to product B, there is inevitably data loss. And then that makes me, the consumer, irritable. And there, there, there is a way to have a happy medium. So we get vendor scrambles. They're playing leapfrog with each other. One company adds new product features, next company adds it, and the third company has it. Then we make extensions to the JEDCOM file, and of course, what company A does is not the same as company B, which is not the same as company C. They all have their unique extensions, which overlap. So one person may, one company may define DNA data and convey it in one form, and the second company 
does it differently. And the third company does it differently still yet. And some of that is deliberate. We're trying to keep up with the Joneses. We're leapfrogging the other guy so that we can keep our own customers. And in some ways, this is very good because we're getting the same functionality across multiple products. And, and the customers at the next company say, well, gee, it'd be really nice, Mr. Software Developer, if you would do this for me too. So they come up with a new version. Then they add a few enhancements. So life is getting better for the consumer, except in this area of sharing and transferring our files. If I use program A and Connie uses program B, it's hard to just drop it into an email and have her get the same information out of the tree in her product, which is different than my product if I'm the user in New Zealand. There's some data loss and it can be critical data loss. But the, the user doesn't know that they've lost the data. They got the tree from Connie and they think they got everything but they didn't. They're not even aware of the data lossage. From a user perspective if we lose data when we move away from the vendor that's not good for us. It complicates life. It becomes a big old thorn in the backside to be blunt about it. It becomes an issue. It's not such an issue that we stop what we're doing. But it's like this nagging issue. I want to share, I lost my data. I want to move and look at the data I lost. I like the reports in program A and I like the reports in program B, but I want both. Can the future be brighter? And the answer to that is yes, I believe the future can be brighter. We have a couple of initiatives that started things off a few years ago. The first was the Better GEDCOM initiative which was formed by a collaboration of bloggers and users and a few software vendors. And they worked away at the program, but it really didn't come to anywhere. We came up with Gen, uh, GEDCOM X was announced at Roots Tech in 2012 by the LDS Church. They were going to go back and work on it. Well, nothing really sort of kind of happened there. Which brings us to today. We have the Family History Information Standards Organization. It is a collaboration of users, bloggers, genealogists, companies from around the world. The website is fhiso.org. When you're seeing their literature and on websites and on the bloggers sites, you will see this logo that indicates they are a supporter of the Family History Information Standard Organization. Translated, they are trying to pull something together to solve the headache. Will it be tomorrow? No. Standards bodies, I've been a member of them for 30 years, differing bodies for differing industries, it takes a couple of years, minimum. But. We've come to a point where consumer displeasure is getting enough momentum to at least get everybody to the table. Okay, We all have a stake in this as genealogists, but we have to recognize the vendors have a stake in this too. And it's not going to happen without their agreement. What can you do? You can support the organization. You can track news releases. They do their press announcements over your favorite blogger sites. There are a lot of different ways that you can keep tabs on what's going on. A lot of the societies are starting to include press releases, pass them along in their newsletters, informing their communities of what's going on. You can check the website. They post their news. You don't have to delve into the inner details of how we describe a person and how we encapsulate the data and pretty soon you're going to be lost in the technical gobbledygook, which is my life actually. But anyway, that's irrelevant. <laughs> but what you're concerned about is the outcome. You don't care what the specification looks like. You care how it functions for you. You don't care about the internal components of your car. 
as long as you put the key in, turn it on, and it goes zooming down the road when you press the gas pedal and of course stops when you hit the brake. You know you need to do things like put gas in it and change the oil. This is all you care about for your car. Similar thing. But you do care because in the end it will make your life easier. When the specification is close to being released, now it's time for you to get involved. We need a grassroots effort. You can contact your tree manager program. When Windows programs, Mac programs, websites, every software program you use for genealogy, get in touch. So are you going to support this new standard? What version will that support be in? Will you be fully compliant with the standard? It's going to take a little bit of pressure. As I said, version 1 in 1984 was intended to transmit data to the church. And that was a big thing in the landscape of 1984. And I don't mean George Orwell's 1984. But today the landscape is very different. The vendors have now dealt with the fact that their customers can migrate away from them very easily. So we need to be able to tell them how important it is to us as genealogists that we be able to share our data with a cousin in New Zealand without data loss. As I said, ask. If enough people ask, as a customer, if enough people demand it, it will happen. Be proactive. If you remember a few years ago, federal government was going to rip SSDI out, the Social Security Death Index. Nobody was going to have access to it. And genealogists went, but, 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 wait, wait, whoa, 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 we like really use that. So a compromise was reached. And people who've died in the last 10 years, their Social Security numbers aren't published. But everybody else's is. Because the, the reality of it is to get a death certificate in the state of Pennsylvania, I need to know their Social Security number. To write in for somebody's SS5, I need to know their Social Security number. There are reasons to want to know that information. So a compromise was arrived at. War of 1812 digitization effort. The community as a whole said, well, if I chip in a few bucks and you chip in a few bucks and everybody chips in a few bucks, pretty soon we'll have all those records online for free. It's successful. It's a successful effort. We can do it. The indexing of the 1940 census was done in large part by volunteers. We wanted it bad enough. We put our effort into it. If we want a better JEGCOM standard that works for us, if we put a little bit of effort into it, not designing the standard, but in conveying to our vendors, our software vendors, and our societies, how much we want this to happen, it's got a better chance of happening. Questions? NGS, I don't believe, I'm not certain though, that the formal bodies, our larger genealogical bodies, have taken a stand. Individual members have. Individual companies have. But I don't know of any of the organizations in terms of the societies that are taking a stand. It is certainly of interest to their members. But if we share with other people who are in our community via those societies our interest and our need to be proactive, that's really what's needed. What, what, I, what I personally believe is needed are voices, is the consumer's voice. People like me, software companies like RumbleSoft, which uses that JEGCOM file, I'm going to support everybody's standard regardless. It's what I need to do to make my software run equally for everybody. If company A doesn't put information out in the JEGCOM file, there's nothing I can do about that. Talk to your vendor. And people have been told that. Customers have been told, I'm sorry, the information's not there. We cannot do analysis including that because it is not there to begin with. But I will support all of their customizations. Yeah. So yeah, that is, that is correct. Yes, the, cur the, the question 
addresses what happens if the larger genealogical, genealogical vendors start dragging their feet once the standard is established. Officially, everybody is on board. Officially, the big guys, the big fish, are on this effort. Who is the, the prime mover between the FHISL? The community. The users, the bloggers, the bloggers are starting to and have in the past few years since the start of Better GEDCOM. They are starting to give voice to the community's frustrations where people say, oh, yes, it allows us to do this. And then somebody else goes, yeah, but then you'll lose all your data. And somebody else says, yeah, I had that experience, too. And oh, and this one. You know. And so they're they're trying to give voice to the consumer's concerns. But in the end, I personally believe to make the entire effort come to pass, it is going to take a an effort not just from certain smaller, very vocal communities. It is going to need to come from the millions, that is millions with an M, of genealogists in the United States as well as the rest of the world. It is going to have to become a global effort. And there are some issues there. We write dates in the United States as we say um, 4364, that would be April 3rd, 1964. Versus Europe, which says 3464, which is thir third day, fourth month, <laughs> third day of April. D does that make sense? So from a technological standpoint, there's not a lot of difficulty in what physically has to be done. It's agreeing to a format and a standard that works for anywhere in the country. Is anybody who's used... Um, some of the files to export their uh, German characters that are in the non-English alphabet or their Polish or their Cyrillic characters, sometimes it comes out looking a little funny and doesn't translate so well. So there are a lot of internationalization, and that's actually the field in the software world, internationalization issues. But they are not technical hurdles in terms of problems that have never been solved the effort needs the will of the consumer behind it. And go ahead. Who or what is the leading this? The bloggers and the companies are, have started to sign on. Who's, who's, leading who's spearheading? Yeah. Name of a person? Or is, uh, name of a group? Or is it a the FHISO is the name of the group that is spearheading and in charge of this effort. Yeah. It is actually a collaboration of developers from all over the world, from companies and bloggers from all over the world who have signed up for this effort. It's no single person. There is not one person leading the charge to get this done. Standards bodies have always been, well, there's two ways to arrive at a standard. The first is the Microsoft way or the Apple way or the Google way, which is you simply dominate the market to the extent that you have a monopoly and you get to dictate the standard. Uh, you know, that's one way to arrive. This is obviously not that. Uh, a lot of the ISO standards, there are standards for life insurance. There are standards for policies on writing a life insurance policy, for doing quotes. I've worked on some of those standards bodies. It can be done. If everybody has a reason and feels a little bit of pressure from the customer to do it. It is done every day in a lot of different industries. Some standards are dictated by government bodies. European Union has their own set of ISO standards, which is where the ISO comes from. The ISO in this is a compliance standard to be used universally anywhere in the world. And so it can happen with a bit of support a little bit of nudge nudge that's not to be hostile towards your software vendor or a pain in the butt but just an email expressing your interest do they have a timeline if they have not signed up you can see a list of the companies that signed up ask them if they're going to sign up a little bit of political activism I think is called for and as I said RumbleSoft is going to support it either way if it never happens we will continue to work the way we always have even though it may be inefficient, 
even though we may have to look at customers sometimes and say, I'm sorry, but your, your, your software vendor isn't writing the information, so there's nothing I can do for you. It's sort of irksome when I have to do that because I feel really bad. But those are really the choices that we live with and the consumer lives with on a daily basis. But I think it can be better. I know it can be better. It may just take a little bit of the willpower from the end user community saying, hey, I care about this. You know, it may be as simple as a $20 donation and just watching in newsletters and watching in the NGS magazines and the quarterlies and the FGS and the societies as they pass along this news of the comings and goings to let the logo and the abbreviation come to your attention and pay attention to what's going on and keep tabs on it. So I'm off my soapbox. I, I, I am done advocating for it. Okay. We're going to do a demo today using PATH version 5 in which we create a GEDCOM file. Okay. So let me jump over to my desktop and run PATH. And PATH stands for Personal Ancestry File. I believe that said version 5.2, which I believe is the last version that was published. As I said, the, the church has announced that it will be sunsetted. It even looks sort of 1990-2000-ish style windows compared to some of the programs. This is my uh, demo file that we use in a couple other videos to create a JEDCOM file. We go up to File and we choose Export. Here is the dialog or the box pop-up, whichever you prefer, that comes up in PATH. In PATH, we choose Other JEDCOM 5.5 and we pick Ansel. Now these options differ from vendor to vendor. Go ahead. Yes, your, your options in your particular program may not look anything like this. <laughs> Some programs give you the option to export all people or partial and select the people. So in Connie's case, when she is sharing with a cousin in New Zealand, she may only do the descendants of the shared couple that they're related to. And then she may choose if she has that option to exclude the living people or hide their dates. So I'm going to pick all because this is a tiny little file with made up people. Yes, I'm going to continue. I am going to save my file to demo. Yes, I'm going to replace it and I exported my file. That's simple. My file is now there. So, let's look at our file. Yes, I would like to open this file. Here's what it looks like. Okay. Up at the top we have a header section and I'm going to try and avoid most of the detail but we'll just take a look. As you can see it's all very human language readable. And, you know, this is the software that created it. The source of this file was PAF, the exact version, the author of the program, the name of the file. And here is the submitter information. That would be me. Remember I said this was a standard in 1984 to submit my family research to the tree. The author is called the submitter right there on the top. And we have this funny little syntax with zero and at sign and something. Zero at sign I. That means a person. There's a person in the family tree. Albert J. Andrews. There's his name. Let me scroll down a little bit. And his given name is Albert. His last name is Andrews. His gender is male. His birth date, so here's his birth event until I get to the next one. He was born about 1866 in San Luis Obispo County, California. FAMS. He's a spouse of family one and he's a child of family two. And so we keep on going and we see the individual Jane Goodman and she is a spouse in family one. Notice she doesn't have the family C. 
and things keep on going and there are some sources in here and all sorts of information and then I wait wait something changed here okay so now we're down to an at F1 so that's family one if we remember from the top that was Jane married to Andrew Jane Goodman married to Andrew well, I'm drawing a blank on what his last name was but it started with an A the husband is person one the wife is person two and the children's are person number seven and eight they were married in 1866, 1886 in San Luis Obispo County, California. And then we continue on with the definition of the next family. So picture your family tree written out in this kind of format. Not very friendly. Not very friendly at all. However, it's very readable by a computer. And so when you say, I'm going to export my family as a GEDCOM file, a file similar to this is created that contains all of that information you compiled about your family. GEDCOM file is a simple text file. It takes a minute to create or two minutes to create. It might take 10 if you've got a really huge family. And it allows us to share our family tree with fellow researchers and websites and other software programs. And in order to address some of the lacks in the GEDCOM standard, we really need to follow the the FHISO and request support. Be proactive. It doesn't hurt to have your voice heard. So being organized is no guarantee of success, but it sure helps. Questions? Nope, they're looking at me like I've given them something to think about. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a wrap then.